It is indeed a pleasure to have this privilege to play here for you. And we, and we intend to give you a very fine program. Check, so just settle check. back, relax, and enjoy my the check. moment. moment, 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 moment. I'm seeing um, when I sent out the newsletter, I see um, the bounce backs. Like a lot of y'all use y'all work emails to get, <laughs> to receive my newsletter, which is fine. Some of y'all are entrepreneurs, so uh, that makes sense. Like you own your own business, so it's not going to cause any static <laughs> per se. I need to make sure that stopped. Um, but yeah, I see. But, but the bounce backs just underscore like what I know to be true, which is people are like, yeah, I mean, they're not always tuning in early on their day off, their weekend off, their week off, their holiday break. Anyway, welcome. This is Mic'd Up. Watching live, you're watching late. I started like three minutes late. Newsletter went out a little bit late, everything, but we're not capitalists, so we're not beholden to too much of that uh, rigidity. But I'm here, and I really do hope that folks, I think I might make this a bonus podcast episode for like the mic'd up podcast the mic'd up podcast is um it's a, it, it, i've already concluded this this season i believe season four <laughs> i've already concluded it was a two-parter uh with uh, alvin johnston <clears throat> but this might be a bonus one it's just calming i kind of want to calm things down uh it's it's the holidays it's we're in between christmas we're, we're in the midst of kwanzaa New Year's is this weekend, um, and folks are just, I, I, I feel it. Folks are just resting and, and just kind of figuring it out. And so today, I kind of feel like today's content coincides with that or kind of jives with that. So I might make this a, a podcast, um, an audio podcast, because it's going to be a lot of music, and I wanted to calm, I just wanted a calming um a calming experience because I do know that, you know, there are less live viewers right now and that's all good. Right. That's really good. Um, so yeah, but, um, before I do all that, before I jump into this morning's, uh, let me actually pull that up and flash it real quick and then come back to it. Come back to it. Bong. All right. I'm gonna switch up real quick. And then switch, which big, hold on. What's that? What's that? What's that? Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So I got some housekeeping to do as well. Um, but so today what I wanted to center is um, what's up, little mama? What you doing up? <laughs> what's up, Denise? Good morning. Um, we're two or more gathered, I swear. Um, I'm going to do some housekeeping after this. But what I wanted to do uh, um, is just introduce the topic and we're going to jump into it. Not going to do a news roundup. Not going to do anything like that. Um, it's uh, Dvorak. Um, Harry T. Burla, Burle, Burle, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Harry, let me say it right. Um, Harry T. Burle, uh, and we'll get the per correct pronunciation as we listen to some more content. Um, and the roots of black music. Good morning, Kelly. Ray. Uh, Kelly, Ray, I just saw I just got a little notification. Thank you. You always going above and beyond. Seriously. Thank you. I just got a little pleasant news. I think that was you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about the roots of black music. We're not going to go as deep as I probably would like to go, but this was influenced y'all. This was inspired rather. And I said this in a newsletter this morning, this was inspired by an encounter I had years ago on the battery. So I was, I was out in Charleston and I was trying to, I was experimenting with podcast content. So I went out there with my mobile recorder. And uh, I want to just ask people if they knew what the Tulalu was. So I was just polling people. And, of course, that, that's like a, a very obscure Charleston fact. Um, but I just wanted to go out there. I talked to young people. I talked to old people. And as I was walking on a battery, um, I can't even remember if I stopped the man or the man stopped me. It was an elderly white gentleman. He had a cap on, like... I, I don't remember what was on the cap, but just think about like a veteran, like maybe a veteran's cap, but it wasn't, I don't believe it was military. But anyway, 
He had a, a, a cat with a, a cap on with a brim. Old man, like, I think he was in his nineties. And I'm I'm so I'm crestfallen because I can't remember his name. But anyway, I'm walking and he's shuffling. He's getting his exercise and walking. The battery is a beautiful day. I think it's 2019. Yep, it, like April of 2019. And he, I just we just start having this conversation. And I think I started to to record it and then I just stopped because I wanted to just be present in the moment and and listen. And he talked about, uh, you know, he talked about Dvorak and he talked about black music. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? And he was just he just shared this history with me. And I never created much of a space for it on my platform outside of my stories on Instagram. Um. So I wanted to just use this platform, use this time, this this very calm period between Christmas and the middle of Kwanzaa, right before New Year's. I wanted to use this really calm period where people are kind of just kind of doing their thing and connecting with family or maybe even just kind of just trying to chill out and reconnect. I want to use today as a place to further share part of the story that this this man shared with me and I'm so blessed to have spoken to this person I didn't have my like, no cell phone it was just us talking right good morning Christy just us talking hey D good morning so I, I wanted to, I wanted to actually honor that conversation I had because um the more and more I think about what I want to do with this platform y'all the more I'm encouraged to just Oh, not overemphasize, but really dig into community. And um, I said this to someone else. Um, I may have mentioned this yesterday as, yeah, we were talking about voting rights and, and voter suppression, gerrymandering. What's up, y'all? Look at y'all here. Y'all supposed to be cooking breakfast. <laughs> um, hey, what's up, rugby? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, so, so like, I thought about this yesterday in terms of like how to build black political power. And I thought about my content. I thought about Charleston. I thought about it's changing, it's ever changing demographics, uh, the growth, both both not so positive and the and and the uh, positive growth. Um, I thought about all of that and thought about how I was raised, um, how I was raised in Titten Falls, New Jersey, a suburb of Monmouth County, New Jersey, Central Jersey, Central slash Northern New Jersey. Um, and I thought about like the richness of, of diversity that I enjoyed as a student, uh, as a young student. And I thought about th- the richness of diversity I enjoyed in undergrad. I didn't go to a PWI. I didn't go to a historically black college either. I went to, a, I went to a very diverse, like, uh, you know, a very diverse college, small college in Jersey city, New Jersey. And it, it was an amalgam, like my, my, the student body was just an amalgamation of just all these different cultures. Anyway, I, that makes me think about. Like connecting with other people is is really gonna for me help us help us be stronger. Every time that I've I've been in these situations, every time I've had complicated uh, my complicated relationship with Charleston, oftentimes forces me to retreat to the safety of rich, vast community. If that makes any sense. When I left high school, I ran to college in the New York metro area in Jersey city. Um, you know, I just always really seek out diverse voices. And so I want to really cultivate spaces where we talk about the complexities in Charleston, not just talk about race in these binary ways of good and bad, you know, um, virtuous versus evil, but also talk about other people's encounter, other people's, um, historically and contemporary other people's encounters with race in America. And that's what Dvorak kind of, that's the gentleman to the far, to the far right. That's what Dvorak kind of did back in the day, like back in the 1800s, right? 19th century, he encountered black culture and it changed his life. It changed his work. And he encountered Mr. Burley here and it changed his life. Who's an African-American from Erie, Pennsylvania, who changed his life, it, you know, changed his work and made his work even more that much rich. And he had this this message for white folks in the in United States about honoring black culture and honoring the future of music, which was black music. Right. So we're going to dig into that. And in that conversation, um, like I said, two, two, what 2019 really, really, um, it, it changed my life. Um, and it reinforced the importance of showing up for community of not just judging a book by its cover, but holding, like just being quiet enough, being patient enough to have a conversation with a stranger who is not the same as you in any regard and, and seeing where that goes. I just rambled for like 10 minutes, but you get it. Good morning. Good morning. What y'all eat for breakfast? 
<laughs> I'm looking at y'all. Y'all so y'all y'all so cute. Tired of cooking breakfast? Hell yeah. Let them. <laughs> they will eat. They will be fine. <laughs> They will be fine, Nicole. I'm looking at y'all in the chat. All right, let's get to it. I just rambled for a little bit, but let's get to it. Um, I'm going I'm to switch back over here to camera only. And uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about Dvorak and, and Dvorak, excuse me. And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about some, we're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, we're going to listen a lot too. Um, I do want to do some housekeeping. So the housekeeping I want to do is probably need to go right back to the split screen. I want to update y'all. No, I want to update y'all on all things can, all things uh, Charleston Activist Network. So a lot of y'all know uh, on the 27th, January 27th, we will be convening virtually. Omicron is a hater, but we will be convening virtually um, to discuss this book. I'm digging in. I'm digging in. I'm And I'm, you know, uh, this has exfoliated my soul already. I feel I'm, all, I'm even more poreless. <laughs> than I typically am. Shout out Nars and Paula's Choice. But no, this is really like, I'm digging in, y'all. This is good. Thank you, little mama. Thank you. Um, so book club meeting. The email will go out this week. I know, I always say that. I always pump fake, but it's coming out. Um, also want to, let me see. Oh, yeah. Also want to, let me see. Boom, 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 boom. Bop, boom, bop, bop, bop. Friends of Gaz and Creek, we have an update. We have an update. <laughs> Let me go ahead <laughs> and hop to the Instagram. We got an update, y'all. That did. I hope that woke y'all up. Yo, I don't have. Uh, usually, I, I buy all my caffeinated beverages, and yo, I ran out of yerba mate, and I had to go to Starbucks this morning. I feel so guilty. All right, so here's the update, right? Friends of Gas and Group. Shout out to Seb. Shout out to everybody. Shout out to the whole gang, gang, gang. Um, so yesterday we made a post, well, we made a post on our Instagram over there. Uh, and so the friends of Gaz and Creek had an update for everyone. Let me see if I can make this a little skosh. So the graphic might get smaller, but you, but you'll, nah, there we go. This is what I want. All right. So hearing date set for the Gaz and Creek lawsuit. So, you know, if you don't know friends of Gaz and Creek, which is, um, uh, an organization that I am a co-leader with a multicultural, uh, grassroots organization fighting in, in environmental racism here in Charleston, um, daylighting the history uh, of, uh, environmental racism, environmental injustice, uh, that was pervasive. That is, and was pervasive in Charleston. We're focusing specifically on the Gaz and Creek issue, even though we can go on and on about the, you know, the incinerator and other things like that, right? Um, and all of the dumping that makes up the peninsula. But anyway, Friends of Gas and Creek is advocating for, for the, advocating against the filling of the creek. And a lot of people don't understand how this is a race issue. It's a race issue because the creek sits right up against Back to Green. Back to Green is the informal uh, uh, name for the Gas and Green area, the Gas and Green pro housing projects, right? Public housing, um, which is home to a predominantly black population. And so we've teamed up with uh, Scalp. And y'all, when, well, when I tell you this was a, a long and arduous process, and it'll continue to be that, we're nowhere near the end of this fight. But when I tell you the process uh, by which that we, I guess the, pro the process that we took to get to this point to where, um, where we had to, in some ways, prove our mettle to Scalp, and I mean that in, in a really positive way. The way we had to frame our argument so that Scalp would take our case, um, to me, it just it, it inspired me to see my 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 fellow comrades in the struggle really band together and lead on this issue and formulate a an argument against the city's intention to fill this creek and to further develop this area of back to green, which is already facing a lot of development, right? Or as Queen Quet says, destruction meant. So if you head over to um, the, the Instagram, you'll see this update. It may be even in on the website. I know we also have a newsletter. And if you are signed up for the newsletter, you probably saw this as well. So on Oct real quick timeline, real quick timeline on October 20th, West Edge fi uh, filed affidavits from their supporter. Uh-huh. From their supporters. So basically our, our lawyers at Scalp said, hey, you know, we started this litigation and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They responded with affidavits. And uh, this is all public record. I have the affidavit saved. I'll save it for another live stream um, where we'll dig into the affidavits of what the mayor said on, on what he said. Um, 
that now he's on the record of saying, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some contradictions. We're going to talk about MUSC's involvement. I think what gets lost in this whole West Edge conversation is the foundation complex, or rather the nonprofit industrial complex. Remember, West Edge was formerly the Horizon Foundation, a nonprofit that was um, created by the former developer and mayor, Joe Riley, with MUSC. Right. Um, so not only is it the mayor, MUSC, the housing authority, all these uh, powerful institutions and individuals um, wrote uh, recently filed an affidavit, you know, with their lawyers and whatnot at West Edge. Um, and right here, it says a full list at the bottom, all expressing the desire to expedite the legal process around filling the gas and Creek. So uh, excuse me, around the gas and Creek lawsuit. So they're trying to fast track it. And we're trying to slow it down, not to be obstructionist, but to. You know, there's no need to, to, to expedite this. You know, we, we, we actually think that this is something we need to be patient and this need to be this needs to be carefully litigated. So we're 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 um, asking for caution. We're asking for patience. And we and we also like we're grassroots. Right. We need time to formulate our argument. And I won't go too far into the legal strategy because I don't want to misspeak or damage our chances um, to really win this lawsuit. But just so just so you know, of course, they've got more power, more money, more resources than us. But guess what we going to do? We going to run out that clock because we know time is money. So we going to hold you up, bruh. We going to hold you up a little bit. And, and we don't I don't mean that in any like uh, nefarious way. We just going to do we're going to use every tool we have legally under the guidance of scalp. Right. Under the very, very, very um, strong and diligent guidance of scalp. We're going to take our time with this and we're going to make sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Right. So West Edge armed their uh, armed with their team of power brokers. Come on. Requested. Uh, the ALC administrative law court to expedite their decision from 12 months to six months, bypassing the standard legal process for the friends of Gazin Creek's lawsuit. So that West edge development can continue to uh, continue as planned in the de destruction of the Gazin Creek and its surrounding wetlands. Right. Right. On November 4th, Friends of Gazin Creek via the via Scalp, the South Carolina Environmental Law Project, submitted a response, pointing out that the inaccuracies of West Edge's argument, chief among them, that they're self-framing as a savior, right? They, so basically, West Edge has now positioned themselves as um, a flood mitigation organization. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? So you went from being you went from being a Fugazi foundation that was just really, um, you know, waiting at the clock a little bit uh, waiting. Well, excuse me. You, you started out as a, a Fugazi foundation horizon. Right. And then you started putting those tiffs in place. Right. Those 11 tiffs, tiffs, nine of which are on the peninsula, I believe. Right. So you needed you needed the tiffs to take from public education, from public works to subsidize this project, which was losing money. It wasn't fine. If you want if you ever ask yourself, well, why didn't they feel the. Riley had 40 years. Why didn't he fill the creek then? It wasn't financially viable. How do you get the money? How do you raise the money to continue to, 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 to fund these development projects? Look at TIFFs. We're going to look at TIFFs and bids later, too. We're going to look at both TIFFs and bids because everyone keeps saying, oh, there they're, they're are positive aspects of them. They're supposed to be, but more often than not, the white and the wealthy um, power interests use and abuse TIFFs and bid districts to undermine um, marginalized communities' best interests, right? And so um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. But, yeah, so they use, they rob Peter to pay Joe, <laughs> you robbed Peter to pay Joe uh, with the TIF district, siphoning money from black schools like Burke and that community, right? You took that money and now, now you have enough money. Now you've also trying to reposition yourself as a flood mitigation organization. You're a fucking developer, yo. Stop it. Just chill out. You're a, you're a development organization. Like, chill out. You're not fooling nobody, right? Please stop. Please stop. You don't even go here. <laughs> Please, <laughs> you don't belong here, right? So, no, West Edge is not an environmentalist organization. No, they're not a flood mitigation organization. No, right? So, pointing out the inaccuracies in West Edge's argument, chief among them that they're self framing as a savior and using residents of Gaz and Green as pawns on top of their baseless claim that FOGC's lawsuit is blocking a solution to urgent flooding. Oh, you can restore the creek. You can restore the creek, and that would actually help with the flooding. And how about this? How about you restore some other shit around here as well, right? How about you? How about you invest in green infrastructure and not more? So, so a parking lot is going to solve that flooding? A parking lot? 
Is that going to solve the flooding? I don't think so. I don't think so. Right? It is well known that the flooding is caused by putting impervious surfaces on top of Gadsden Creek since 1958. Impervious surfaces here is just a fancy phrase for you dump, you dump, you dump, you dump garbage on black people. You dump garbage in black people's backyard. You dump garbage in back pe- black people's creek where they were fishing and crabbing from, feeding their families from every day. Y'all know, y'all see this. That's one thing I love about living in Charleston is that you go across damn near any bridge or you pass by any creek, you'll see somebody down there crabbing or, or doing their thing down there. Well, that's what they were doing over there by Burke, by the Citadel, by, by all that. that. That hump you go over. When you go over there and you you heading to President Street to Hey Good, that hump, shout out, shout out, thank you. That hump you go over, that's a pipe. The pipe is staying in place. The rest of the street is sinking because the re- because what's that impervious surface is nothing but landfill, right? So they created more real estate throughout the entire peninsula, even over there by Colonial Lake, by by dumping and creating more real estate, right? And cre- and, and using impervious surfaces, dump, landfill, right? All right. So they've been um, imper- by putting impervious impervious surfaces on top of Gadsden Creek since 1958, um, filling in y'all thousands of acres, right? If not, let me say hundreds, because I'm I'm not quite sure what the acreage is. I'm gonna say hundreds, hundreds of acres. All right. In more affluent areas of Charleston experiencing similar tidal flooding, the city has cleared out the storm drains and installed tidal flap gates. Let me read that again. In more affluent areas of Charleston experiencing similar tidal flooding, the city has cleared out the storm drains and installed tidal flap gates. So they've invested in affluent communities, whereas the, the, the they are proposing to fill in black areas that they have robbed of resources for for over for years. Right. So none of these, remember too, like now it's housing projects, but back in the day, back in the day, back the green was, a, was home to the most like upwardly mobile, economically upwardly mobile, um, you know, population of black folk. It was the most, like they were earners, they were teachers, they were educators, they were homeowners, uh, they owned their homes. The tornado came through and they were like, oh, disaster capitalism, that's our jam. So we're not going to let you build your home back, black people. We're just going to take your home from you, take your land, and then build projects and put you in a cycle of never-ending poverty for generations. That's, that's, the, that's a short, short Cliff Notes version of what they did, Right. So those black people beg Mayor Maybank, beg them like, yo, look, I got all these people behind me. We're going to build our homes back. We're raising money. We had this county. We had this little fair over here. We invited white folk to come and help us raise money so we can raise our houses back. City was like, nah, we want your, we want your house. We want your house. We want your land. Right. Right. Preventing them from building equity, passing on that wealth to generations. You get it. Right. So, again, they invested in in, in flood mitigation, um, uh, flood mitigation uh, strategy or or like they they invested in flood mitigation in affluent areas. Right. Uh, But not in back the green. None of these measures have been taken on behalf um, have, have been taken on behalf of the families of Gaz and Green who like all citizens want to live work and play safely all right and so this is our response here so so you know the affidavits that are public record you can either you can either snoop around and find it or you can add, hit me up like Miki can I see an affidavit I'm like sure you want to see what the mayor said about the creek you want to you want to see some things that are not not quite accurate right um and and and, uh, and you want to see an inaccurate framing of the issue I'll show you an affidavit Allegedly inaccurate. Let me say that before I get fucking cease and desistes. Cease and desistes. <laughs> All right. Um, Mayor Tecklenburg is on, was one affidavit. Uh, Donald Cameron, CEO of Housing Authority. MUSC David Cole, president. He went on there talking some some foolishness, allegedly. Uh, West Edge Neighborhood Association, George Palmer. Long story. Terracon. Terracon. When you see Terra, Terracon, say Fugazi Science. Fugazi's, think Dr. Oz. Think Dr. Oz when you hear Terracon. <laughs> yeah, you a doctor, but you subscribe to some really quacky shit, right? Some really, really, yeah, right? Um, Richard, <laughs> Richard uh, Karkowski, Stormwater Engineer and West Edge Foundation, Michael Mayor. Remember, too, sitting city councilman um, Shahid, his wife, uh, is a lawyer with West Edge, too. So we'll always look out for some conflicts there. He does tend to recuse himself on issues, but 
I think there's some more recusals that he could really take, you know, when it comes to this West Edge situation. But just 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 watch that. Watch that space, as Rachel would say, okay? I had to get that out. I think that was time well spent um, talking about the the update. Somebody in the comments was like, what's next? Or what, what do we do now? And I was like, hold on to your, hold on to your hat, sweetie. Um, not in a bad way. Just the person was like, what do we do now? I'm like, yeah, we like, and, and just so y'all know too, friends of Gadsden Creek, we meet very regularly, very, very regularly. I met as recently as yesterday. Um, so just, we're working on a number of things and this is the thing too. I want y'all to also please. Hey, L Cool J. Um, I'm spiritually, mentally, cosmically, <laughs> um, I want you <laughs> psychologically, physiologically, I want y'all to, I want y'all to, this is what I want people to do. So what I like, what I love about Friends of Gazin Creek is that it's real hard. It's hard work. It's different personalities. It's differences of opinion. It's different backgrounds, all colliding to try to try to advocate for this black community and also for this creek and the history that the creek still holds, right? This, these last four remaining acres. But what I what I also what, so so what does that mean? That means that a lot of what this this fight is going to be a lo- it's a it's a marathon, it's a long haul, and if you are expecting constant updates and if you've been trained by Twitter and Instagram to expect some sort of immediate. Uh, I'm not saying anyone said that or but sometimes I I see questions like well what do we do we're we're doing it we're doing it stay engaged sign up head to the website um we've been you know we've been speaking publicly look at the look at the feed we've been speaking publicly we've been we've been in the press we've been talking to reporters we've been hosting cleanups or we've been collaborating with others to clean up we're meeting regularly virtually with residents right here like John here um at Gas and at, at you know over there at the Gas and Green projects we've had art exhibitions we've won awards this uh we've won awards this this uh past summer um uh, you know, we, we shot, look at little mama. We've had mutual aid events with little mama right here in the community, right? We're ta- ta- tagging, tag teaming with like other coalitions. Um, so yeah, just stay tuned. And this is, this is a, a long fight. It's not going to be one that's won over Twitter or Instagram. And we definitely don't want to jeopardize the success of our, of our legal strategy. Right. And so if you want to know what's next, just stay tuned and be patient too. Um, and don't expect like fireworks every day that I just, I just want to help people manage the expectation. This is a really, really tough bit of work. It's some of the toughest work I've ever been a part of. And, um, yeah, I love it. I love it. I should have told that lady in the comment section, share this video. What do we do now? Share this video. Share this. We're trying to tell Charleston that the way they've gone about doing business, the way they've gone about planning their growth um, has had adverse effects on predominantly African-American communities and poorer communities in Charleston. Yeah, share that. We was on now this, y'all. Yeah, that's what that's what people should do. So anyway, we're, we're, we're working. We're working. Got some things that we can't talk about yet. And I'm excited. I'm excited. Okay. Um, Real quick. Real quick, my favorite phrase, my favorite transitional phrase. Um, no, 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 let me do this. What I want to do. If I don't bookmark my damn uh, personal stuff, I'm gonna just get mad. Okay, I'm gonna open up the newsletter real quick, y'all, and then I'm gonna get into it. It's gonna be, I'm gonna get into it. We're gonna get some music. So if you want to kind of like just listen along with me, you're gonna, I'm gonna let some things play that aren't video, all of that. Um, let me open up my newsletter. Uh, so you got this in your inbox this morning. Hopefully, hopefully little mama, keep calm and listen. Um, talking about Dvorak, Burley and, uh, the roots of black music. That's what came through, but I want to just give an update. Oh my God. What's going on? <laughs> Button's not even closed. So I do that. I, I guess cause that's all color green. I want to hit it. So update. First of all, I already said this yesterday. Y'all are killing it. Y'all are killing it. Y'all are so super dope. My goal was to sell 100 pieces um, from the fundraiser. We're at 90... Shit. 93? I don't know. Can we make it? Can we sell like... Can we sell like four... 93? 
Can we sell like six more today? T-shirts? I don't know. Can we can we do it? Y'all have been killing it. And I don't want y'all, I don't want some of y'all, my faithful, uh, buying double. Joy, I saw you. <laughs> I don't want y'all buying double, double. I don't, y'all already, already been killing it. Um, but, um, I don't know. Maybe we can get some, we can get, we get to a hundred. So we, we just shy of my, my hundred goal and that's important. But y'all, I'm, I'm really, I'm already, I thought I would only sell 50. Honestly, my goal was a hundred. I said, I probably only sell 50. Y'all have already exceeded my expectations. And I really appreciate it. On Thursday, McKenzie and them headspace will be on the live stream. They better wait. I hope you listening, McKenzie. <laughs> At Elliot, y'all, they already said yes, but yeah, uh, Headspace will be on Thursday to talk about their work, this collaboration, what they've been up to, all of that, all they fly dope art, as you can see here from their Instagram feed. Oh yeah, oh, oh excuse me, from their website, right? So we'll be talking about talking to Elliot and Mackenzie very, very soon on Thursday. I'm excited, <laughs> right? All right, so that's that. Also, big, big, big news. <laughs> Big news. Today is the final day of the contest. I'm excited. I'm going to go to Holy City Tattooing Collective tomorrow at noon. <laughs> Annoying y'all this morning. This will not be in the podcast. <laughs> we'll edit this all. But no, I'm going tomorrow at noon with the with the homie back here, Jess. We will be drawing the win the winner, randomly drawing the name. I got a flurry of, of last minute entries. People donating five bucks, 10 bucks. I love you. I see you, but we will be picking a winner and you get to see, you get to, you'll get to see whether or not you win uh, your free tattoo. I'm excited for y'all. I'm excited. No home cooking though. Hopefully it'll be random. Even though I'm rooting for, <laughs> I'm rooting for a couple of y'all. It'll be random. So make sure you check it out. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. I might do a second newsletter because I have to I have to update people on Friends of Gazin Creek and I have to update people on this contest. It ends today, tomorrow at noon. I'll be over there. I'll probably turn on maybe I can turn on my phone and um Twitch stream from there. Live stream went from my phone there. I'm thinking about doing that. Maybe we'll play it up like that. So people will tune into that and see if they won. Okay. Um so yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Now let's get to what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, right here. All right. The roots of black music. And again, this was inspired by a conversation I had by a random stranger, a historian, older white man. Got it. Had to be 90 years old, getting exercise on the battery, just walking and wanted to stop me and had this long conversation about symphonies and orchestras and all of that. And it changed my life and inspired me. Art always does that. So I'm going to acquaint y'all with, with acquaint some of y'all to, to, uh, with, with some, yeah, we're going to start here. We're going to start here. Let me see what y'all saying. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick me, pick my name. Yeah. Okay. Little mom. <laughs> I'll pick your name. <laughs> all right all right you get a check listing as a tech <laughs> oh <Meg-Z. laughs> all right so this is eight minutes npr i just want y'all to relax be present all right i'm not i'm not good at semantics i kind of want to be into semantics i want you to relax i want you to ground yourself right now right i'm gonna chill out with the sound effects I'm gonna chill out with the sound effects we're going to dig in to some history. We're going to center this in Charleston. We're going to, uh, for me, I'm going to meditate on what I'd like to see here artistically in Charleston, how I'd like to see my culture embrace historic, like historically and contemporary expressions, how I like to see that uh, embraced. I'm thinking about the Charleston I want to live in. I'm thinking about that encounter with that older white man on the battery and how, um, no, it didn't make me like, it didn't, it didn't make me, it, it didn't lead me to romanticize a post-racial Charleston. That's not what I want. I want our differences to bring us together. I want us to maintain the things that make us unique and different, but I want that difference, those differences to live together in harmony. 
Um, I have a vision of equity. I have a vision of, of artistic expression for Charleston that I really want to see in my lifetime. And I just want you to ground yourself right now, be present in the moment and think about the Charleston. Even if you got plans on leaving, even if you don't, you know, this ain't your hometown, whatever it is, think about the Charleston. Though. I'm sure if you, if you live here, you love Charleston. I'm sure if you watch this, you love Charleston, right? Just think about the Charleston you really want, the Charleston that your children deserve, even if you don't have any kids, <laughs> The Charleston that the future, the young folk deserve. Just think about that as we get into this. And think about this conversation. This is from 2018. And this encapsulates so much. Uh, uh, like this story is what we're going to just center. In. And it's not directly related to Charleston, but it is. We're going to bring it to Charleston. Okay? Shout out to the Charleston uh, Symphony. Sometimes it takes an outsider to recognize what's remarkable about a culture. That's what the Czech composer Antonin Dvorak did when he came to the U.S. at the end of the 19th century. He was an immigrant thrown into a new world and new sounds, and out of that experience, he wrote a symphony for America. Dvorak's New World Symphony has become one of the most beloved orchestral works in the world. It also produced a melody that's a hymn and an anthem to what American music could be. NPR's Tom Heisinger has the story for our series, American Anthem. When Antonin Dvorak came to the U.S. in 1892, the Pledge of Allegiance was new. So was Carnegie Hall, the game of basketball, and Edison's wax cylinders. Shout out New Jersey, Thomas Edison. Classical music in America wasn't new, but it needed a reboot, and Dvorak was the man to do it. Already a celebrated composer in Europe, Dvorak was hired to run a national conservatory in New York to help American composers find their own voice and shake off the European sound. At the time, American concert music sounded an awful lot like Brahms and Beethoven. Dvorak heard something different in an unexpected place, as he told the New York Herald just before he debuted his New World Symphony. Listen. The future of this country must be founded upon what are called the Negro melodies. This must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in the United States. The Negro Melodies. That's a reading of Dvorak telling white Americans the future of their music resides in the people they subjugated and killed. It was radical, and I think that he got harshly criticized and really rejected. Joanne Folletta is the music director of the Buffalo Philharmonic. She's conducted Dvorak's New World Symphony many times. Dvorak was surprised, in a way, to find that the roots of American music were not European, they were African-American. Including spirituals. Dvorak may have even heard the Fisk Jubilee singers who were popular at the time, but Joe Horowitz, author of the book Classical Music in America, says Dvorak's real connection to African-American spirituals was a young black man named Harry Burley. He'd applied to be a student at Dvorak's National Conservatory. Harry Burley. Dvorak chose a black person to be his assistant. How likely is that? Remember, this is America in the 1890s. So put yourself in Dvorak's head. He's probably thinking at least two things. I want to help this young black man, and this young black man is going to help me. Harry Burley was a self-taught baritone. sang spirituals to Dvorak, like Go Down Moses, which the composer said had a melody to rival Beethoven. Horowitz says Burley also sang Swing Low, Sweet Chariot to Dvorak. And Burley claimed that Dvorak was actually quoting Swing Low. In the opening movement of the New World Symphony, says Horowitz, who's at the piano to demonstrate. First, the melody of Swing Low. Listen, we're going to talk about this. Now, listen to how Dvorak's melody flows out of that. Mm. Our influence is undeniable. Our contributions are undeniable, y'all. 
this is this is not the only example. This is one of millions. Dvorak, mm -hmm. the outsider immigrant, could see something American composers were blind to. There was a rich tradition to draw on right in front of their noses, and Dvorak showed them how to do it. He wove American roots music into his vast symphonic canvas, and inspired by black spirituals, he came up with a melody that would become a spiritual on its own, the Largo, the symphony's second movement. After Dvorak died, it was turned into Going Home by William Arms Fisher. And most people who know Going Home assume that it's a spiritual that Dvorak quoted. But it wasn't. Joe Horowitz says William Arms Fisher was a white student of Dvorak who added words to the composer's melody, which went from the concert hall to church hymn books. My family all thought it was a spiritual. Bass baritone Kevin Days first heard Going Home as a kid when he didn't realize the music was by Dvorak. We had Going Home in our hymnals that I grew up singing, and so I was Undeniable familiar with the influence. melody, but there was just this instant sense of I could identify with this music. So Days recorded it. It has that sense of longing, and so much of the African-American spiritual tradition comes with this idea that heaven or home is a, a beautiful place to go Wait to. Wait a minute, who's that? Dvorak's Auntie Blurred. Largo became not you. just an anthem for the weary, but also a hymn for those who've died. It was performed at memorial events for Presidents Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Gerald Ford. Spirituals, mm. they inspired Dvorak, and in turn, he created one that inspired black composers and musicians, including pianist Art Tatum, who made the Largo swing back mm. in 1949. Dvorak had a dream that American composers would follow his example, cultivate their own musical soil to grow distinctly American anthems of their own. We blew it. Author Joe Horowitz. We never fulfilled Dvorak's prophecy. Listen. We squandered it. It was popular music that soaked up the African-American influences, which is great, Horowitz adds. Still, Joanne Folletta says some did hear the call of Thank Dvorak's New World Anthem. He made American composers think about music differently and the entire history of 20th century American music changed because of Anson and Dvorak. Mm. And maybe his prediction then gave composers like Gershwin the feeling that using jazz and writing for a classical orchestra was okay. I got beef with Gershwin, though. I got beef with Gershwin. <laughs> now, that's Charleston. George Gershwin looked to jazz, and Aaron Copland would look to American folk music. But before any of them was Antonin Dvorak. Now I got and before the birth of jazz, R&B, and hip-hop, this face. old white European predicted that the future of music in America will be black. And he was right. Yes, I think what's happened yep. is that the roots of American music, whether it be African American or Native American or ragtime or Louisiana bayou music, all of that has now become accepted as a rich part of our fabric of our musical life. And that musical melting pot is what Antonin Dvorak celebrated and even elevated in his New World Symphony, a philosophy of inclusion rendered in music. Tom Heisinger, NPR News. And, you know, it's, 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 it's always important to make sure that, like, when you look at this work that Antonin Dvorak created and how he... I feel, and what I've read from him, I feel like it wasn't white saviorism. Now, I haven't studied, ex I haven't studied his work and his life extensively, but what I have read since encountering this elderly um, historian on the Battery, um, what I have read here, Jester, um, you know, you just name the the whatever it is I, I try to like Google and search for from home. What I have read, it really made I responded favorably to it. And I was just joking when I said I had beef with Gershwin. 
it's not that I have a complicated relationship with Porgy and Bess. So that's more so of a, of a Hayward situation. You know, the author of the, of the actual book first, and then it got turned into all this musical, like the, it got turned into an orchestra and, uh, and, uh, an opera. Right. Right. Um, but I, sometimes I feel like with Gershwin and Hayward, it was, um, it, it, there was respect for black artistry there, but the depiction of black life always unsettled me. The whole Porgy and Bess story always unsettled me um, because of just like, okay, so you observe this, this black culture here in Charleston on Catfish Row. And, you know, I don't know if you respect or love it, or you just trying to like exploit it or mine the community for for its richness in terms of language and, 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 and cultural contributions or all of that. But for Antonin um, Dvorak, I feel like he really was touched and moved. And I think maybe, maybe it's because he was European. I don't know. And, and maybe I guess I'm thinking about the ways that Europeans have always embraced black culture, whether it was Josephine Baker and her uh, doing amazing work over in France, whether it was, um, you know, uh, James Baldwin, um, shoot. Um, I think even Ida B. Wells had made it over to London and was embraced. Like, so sometimes I think there's a European perspective where they come and like, oh shoot, um, hey, uh, America, y'all really trying to subjugate and and uh, kill, subjugate and kill uh, one of your richest resources. So I'm gonna read directly a quote from. Dvorak that I posted in my stories back in 2019 and you heard you heard this in the um the piece just just then from NPR Dvorak said this Antonin Czech composer Antonin Dvorak said this the future of this country must be founded must be founded upon what are called Negro melodies at the time well let me get let me get this let me get this right all right, Dvorak, and we heard this too, told white Americans that the future of their, mu- of their music resided in the people they had subjugated and killed. Dvorak told white Americans, this is what I think separates some of the Haywards and the, and the, and the, the Gershwins, is that he was very, very um, forward about saying, hey, America, the people that you relegated to the margins and not just African-American music, but also native indigenous contributions to music and art. He, he lifted that up too. He gave that, he gave that, um, gave that power. He spoke about that, but here again, let me read it again. Dvorak told white Americans that the future of their music resided in the people they had subjugated and killed. Right. So now I'm going to transition to a, a YouTube clip that gives you more too. But this first part, because this is more for, um, I think, uh, cellists, maybe like Auntie Blurred or like people who play music. But the beginning part is very instructive. And then we'll bounce out to um, another uh, uh, piece. So you know more about Harry because we didn't really get into to, to Burley yet. We, you heard how Burley encountered Harry Harry. Um, how, how, excuse me, how Dvorak encountered Harry Burley. We heard a little bit about that, but we're going to learn more about that collaboration, encountering this black man and lifting up this black man and not doing it in the spirit of patron, um, of, of paternal, paternalism, excuse me, right? Um, lifting up this work. I don't know. I, I might be, I might be off. I had to do more research on Antonin Dvorak. Antonin Dvorak was a comp- But I feel, it just feels a little different. It feels like he, no, he, he was like, wow, what is this music? This moves me. I want to, I want to be, I'm inspired by it. And I want to work with people who are of this culture, um, side by side. Composer of the Romantic era. He was born near Prague in 1841 and soon made a name for himself as a musician and composer. Today, we're going to look at his time spent in the United States. From 1892 to 1895, Dvorak was the director of the National Conservatory of Music in New York City. The conservatory was founded by wealthy philanthropist Jeanette Thurber with the intention of establishing an American style of music and musician. In that spirit, she invited Dvorak to come to the United States and help establish this American school of music. His ninth symphony was written in the first year that Dvorak was in the United States. So that's that one right there from the New World, right? Uh, and this the main is idea this is this is how was to use 
This is how I'm gonna rewind a little bit. I talked over it. <clears throat> this is what what the 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 older gentleman that I encountered on the battery. This is what he spoke to. Like this is what he led with. He said, "Have you ever heard of the New World Symphony?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> no. What is it?" To the United States and help establish this American school of music. His ninth symphony was written in the first year that Dvorak was in the United States. The main idea behind the symphony was to use African American and Native American music as inspiration. Much like how Dvorak and other composers had used European folk music as a basis for their compositions. Dvorak wanted to use those elements because he wanted to write something that would become what he called an American school of composition. Think about how Franz Liszt used Hungarian folk music in his Rhapsodies or how Chopin used the traditional Polish dance mazurka in his compositions. Dvorak wanted to try the same thing with traditional American folk music, and he saw American folk music as being Native American and African American music. There seems to be a bit of confusion about how Dvorak was going to write this piece. To Dvorak, he was just using the Native American and African American spirituals as inspiration to write his own melodies that would have the same spirit or essence. However, some critics and composers at the time thought that he was just going to steal the Native American and African American music and use it in his orchestration. So I think he got some undue criticism on that point because he wasn't blatantly stealing the melodies to use in his music. However, <laughs> we'll see in a little bit that he comes very close with one of his themes to an existing... Now, now that's, that's, the, that's the rub right there. And I think this is... I don't want to say it's unavoidable because it is avoidable. But that's the rub right there. There is no real... So this is... <laughs> um, that line between reverence and... I don't even want to call it plagiarism because I don't think it's that. Or like when your work... Is the word referential? When the work is just... It resembles something that black people have already created when it so closely resembles that it can really get problematic. I don't think like, this is not minstrel Z. This is not that right. This is not the, what is it? The spiritual society. What's that society that's in um, the, 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 Oh my God. What was it? It was the, the those spit that spiritual society, dumbass group in Charleston of white people who said that black people didn't sing their spirituals good enough. So they, they took it from them. <laughs> Um, and then held down the whole industry and held blacks out of it. It's not that it's not that that type of of, of movement, but you, you know what I mean. You know, it's almost like let me think. Let me think of a pop artist who took a little flip. Ed, okay, Ed Sheeran. Recently, Ed Sheeran. Um, not recently, not too long ago though. Ed Sheeran was held to account when he released a song that had similar or, or vi like had the melodies from no, uh, from scrubs that was written for TLC by two members of the, um, R and B group escape. Right. And Ed Sheeran had to, they had to, the legal got involved. I was like, wait, hold up. This is no scrubs melody. Right. We know you love music. Think K-pop too. K-pop kind of, I got a complicated relationship with K-pop. Yeah. I mean, very, very nineties, Hip hop, R and B vibes, um, in in Korean uh, packaging, but but um, like Ed Sheeran had to add uh, the the composers of No Scrubs it had to basically give them money and 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 you know uh, royalties from his hit song. I can't remember what the song was. Some so sometimes reverence for a culture can lead to you borrowing a little bit too much sugar without asking. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to stop that one there because it does get into the music, um, gets very um, technical about music. But here we want to know more about Harry T. Burley, um, which is important. And then we're going to listen to some Charleston. On, um... Oh, wait, hold up. They had an unbelievably long intro. <laughs> I'm trying to get it. Here we go. Henry Thacker Burley, often referred to as Harry T. Burley. I keep saying Burley, y'all. Y'all know me in names and words. Y'all know me by now. So y'all get me, though. I'll, I'll probably say both, both ways the whole time because I'm just weird like that. A significant role in the development of American art song, having composed <laughs> over 200 works in the genre. He was the first African-American composer acclaimed for his concert songs, as well as for his adaptation of African-American spirituals. In addition, Burley was an accomplished baritone, a meticulous editor, and a charter member of the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, 
A-S-C-A-P. Henry Thacker Burley was born in Erie, Pennsylvania on December 2nd, 1866. Look at that. Was that a communion gown? Burley was surrounded by music from a young age. His mother was his first music teacher, and he learned the African-American spirituals, for which he would later become famous, from her and from his maternal grandfather, who had been enslaved but had successfully purchased his own freedom. So I came to know H.T. Burley as a Negro spiritual arranger. When I discovered his art song, uh, this would probably have to, this was during my doctoral program. I included them on a recital I prepared. And, oh, at the African-American Art Song Alliance. That's when I first heard one of his art songs. And I gotta say, like, it baffles me that he's not known for his art songs because mm -hmm. for me, the art songs are more intimate, more, more lush, more uh, unique. I would say uh, they give us. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about how, like how Harry T. Burley was like relegated to obscurity as well. Like they're not, there was a, a, a study or a paper written about him that speaks to his invisibility and his brilliance. And like, people don't really know his work. They know the Rorjack, right? And that's the other, that's the other rub too, right? Shout out to y'all using y'all, redeeming y'all bits. I see y'all. I love y'all. <laughs> um, I love it. Um, and oh, I same facade. I missed your, I missed your comment. I'm gonna read that. I missed that earlier. Um, but um, this is the other rub: is that we know Gershwin, we know Hay Hayward, you know what's his face from Porgy and Bess, but we don't know like the real Porgy, right? We don't, we don't know too much of the people who help to make this work, but yet that work lives on and on and on and on because of the its proximity to whiteness. And, and it's the, the legitimacy that's gifted to whiteness. And you, we don't often look at who is behind that, that, um, that brilliance. And even like, this is something that me and my mom joke about so much. Whenever I um, bring her like soul food or we eat soul food at a place that's uh, white owned, um, we play this game. We play really gnarly games that I, I don't feel comfortable talking about <laughs> on Twitch or publicly. But being that my mom was born of a different era and she was born and raised in the Jim Crow South, like my father um, often talks about black recipes at white restaurants. Like it just comes up naturally. And while we're having this very surface level conversation about mm, they must got a black grandmother back there. But, but we all know black people, we all know that, you no, know, these recipes came from black kitchens. You know, we, we talked about this when we talked about food justice and we played the Davida, John, the Davida Johnson um, clip, um, oh, excuse me, Davida Dav Davison clip, excuse me, um, about like hot chicken is a black creation and it was isolated because it existed in a segregated community in its earlier days. And then when the white folks wandered to the other side of the tracks and it's like, oh shit, chicken got mad seasoning uh i think i'm gonna columbus this shit and sell it as my own right like we had these conversations about so much black brilliance uh giving birth to like global phenomenons but black people it doesn't trickle down to black people it doesn't trickle down to we don't get the fame we don't get the prestige not often and i think this is an example of that where they mine our communities for these gems of brilliance just to emerge with their own wealth and prosperity y'all are lighting it up Y'all are lighting it up. Let me um go back up because same facade, you popped something in the chat. I wasn't ignoring you. Um, oh, you got 72,000 points. You better spend them points. Highlight them comments. Um, same facade, you said Europe has a long history of that. I mean, we're talking about when I was saying Baldwin, talking about Baldwin and um, Josephine Baker and a, and a couple of black expats. Yeah. Um, Europe has a long history of that. For example, House and EDM. Yes. Yes, I'm from I'm from Jersey. So Newark, me and my brother, we go back and forth because he's in Chicago now. He doesn't own Jersey the way I do. He's he's abandoned us for the Midwest. He's a Mid my brother is a Midwesterner. Just just so y'all know, he's no longer he can no longer claim New Jersey. But no, Chicago and Newark have huge roots in house music. And then that house and EDM. Right. 
originated black queer culture, right? And then, right, found more space and influence in Europe than, than here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that contribution to this conversation, right? And then, uh, little mama, you wrote something later. Um, uh, anything that is new <laughs> or cool in quotation marks, people, black people did it first. Uh, uh, black and brown people did it first. Like, look at voguing, right? Madonna discovered it, and then it became a thing. But we've been voguing. You know, look, watch the film Paris is Burning for more on that. Uh, oldie but goodie, right? Yeah, or bounce, bounce music. Yeah, yeah. I, I hopped on TikTok as I want to do. Um. And I see a lot of white girls twerking, which is fine. I mean, yeah, I ain't, ain't going to have those arguments no more about, like, you know, white girls wearing cornrows and shit. Uh, they know what they're doing. But I'm like, oh, black girl, but white girls is twerking now, huh? Oh, white girls want fat fat booties now. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same for side. You went on to say that your head exploded when your history teacher told you uh, that the banjo was an African instrument. Yeah. Yep. And, blue, and origins of bluegrass and country music. I'm telling you. Even like um, when you, I watch a lot of westerns because I love it, and I also watch them with my dad. Who watches like all those like series. He likes Gunsmoke. He doesn't really like the movies. He likes those series that re air on like Me TV. <laughs> um, and we talk about I'm like dad. Like one in four cowboys were black. <laughs> like we just we get erased from so many things, right? Uh, K Slaughter eighty four. It's good to see you again, K Slaughter. It angers you so much, you say in the chat, so much how much uh, how ignorant we are to the real history of everything. Yo, can I let me stop it right there? And that's that's what kind of breaks my heart about the whole CRT fight. Look, I know a lot of it is just agitation from a lot of right leaning dark money. A lot of it is not even real, a real argument. It's just making noise. Right. The, the objective is not to be accurate in their opposition to CRT. Their 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 golden objective objective is to have you question any type of black culture or history or any type of introspection into our history. Right. That's the goal. The goal is not to be really accurate about the offense. I, what, what are you offended by with CRT? That The goal is to just get you to doubt the need for black history and culture to be taught or the need to decolonize the canon in public schools or, or, or in higher ed. Right. That's that's the goal. That's one of the primary goals of the CRT debate, and I, and I use debate very loosely, it's, it's just a cacophony of noisiness. Um, they're just stoking, um, they're using racial animus as a means to an end, right? Um, but that that the, there is a heartbreaking component to the argument, which is y'all don't know what y'all missing. Like, it's not about shame and guilt. Like, yeah, that's a part of it. And learning and learning and unpacking your own white supremacist tendencies and your own internalized white supremacy should be very uncomfortable. It should be painful. It should be very painful. Right. And it should disrupt a lot in your life. If you're white shit, if you're black, too. But if you're white specifically, it should be very uncomfortable. Very. They don't tell you that in REI and DEI training. They just tell you to come and get this, this gold star and leave. Let me stop. But no, it should be very uncomfortable, right? Overwrought. Um, but, but the other part of it is you encounter so many amazing stories from indigenous cultures, from black culture, from Latinx culture, from Asian cultures, all of these things that made this country great. Um, and I do mean that, like I, I, you know, my four, my four mothers and forefathers built this country, um, with their exploited labor. So I do have a sense of pride and connection to this country. And I love this country just like I love Charleston, even though it, 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 it betrays me at every turn. It feels like I love this country. I love this city. Um, and it's like, but when you, when you want to just attack something and you don't want to understand it and you're, or you're confused by your misunderstanding, you really miss out. And it breaks my heart that you don't want to learn more about uh, the banjo or the spirituals. And that, that's why I had the book open. Right. And you read. Yeah, we'll get to the SPS in a second. Um, yeah. Um, D, you said something earlier uh, that was highlighted. Whiteness just needs to accept the fact that we all live, what we all have, what we all have is stolen. And that's really, really hard for people to understand. Right. I'm going to con continue reading your um your comment, case law 84, after you said um, the real history of everything, right? It angers you. It says, I want the truth. That's what you say. I want the truth and not these whitewashed lies. And like, and not all of it is wrapped up in shame. And if you do feel shame, you sh that's a 
reasonable response. And why are we living this? Cult- we live in a culture right now that is very against shame. Like, like I think that's how that's how and why people. First time, let me see how and fi- how and let me see asking white people to be uncomfortable. Who's this? Uh, it says uh, Abel Cain two sixty nine asking white people to be uncomfortable is and has always been the issue. Hello, uh, they try to erase the past because they'd have to look within themselves and come to terms that the most of what they have now is somehow off the backs of others, and even if not directly linked. They understand that they can see other whites that have made it uh, a piggy uh, made it and piggyback much more easily from that than any of us people of color could. You ain't. Psh. Yeah, now listen. That's, that's called motherfucking, motherfucking bars. Bar. Um, yeah. Thank you for that contribution. First time chat. First time caller. Long time listener. Let me stop. <laughs> but thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um. Yeah, and I know I, I was re, I was saying something, but that was that was worth uh, interrupting my my train of thought. That was value added comment, right? The current boogeyman, right? Um, D, absolutely. Auntie Blurred, what you you responded to D saying white fear is nearly incomprehensible in its protective response, right? And like, oh, I was saying about shame. Like, so now we're we're like, like, so I think it's easy to like lob all these comments in the comment section because we're not seeing the immediate reaction of someone like if people only knew how my heart skips a beat whenever I get like a racist comment, like when I, when I uploaded the white angry men, uh, Twitch stream to YouTube, that one, you know, people who look for content that they don't like, I never do that. I never, I never go to the overgen report. I never go to Fitz news. I, there's nothing there for me, but there's people who literally look for shit that angers shit. I don't even watch the news anymore because like they curate clips. Like if I watch it on YouTube, they curate clips to get the emotional response. They've, they figured out what made Facebook so lucrative and they've mimicked it across a, a number of other platforms. Um, Facebook gets a lot of heat as they should, but they ain't the only one that traffics in that nonsense of just stoking, um, certain, you know, stoking stoking some hateful fires there but um people have gotten out of this have gotten away from understanding that shame is an important response it's a human response shame and empathy is something that we should talk and explore more but in in cities like this um we've coddled white people so much and we've whitewashed history so well that anything that is outside of what they've been taught feels so uh, uh, wrong even when you even i have a book right behind me that i just found underneath all these stacks of old new york times uh new p- newspapers um slave narratives even when they have in their hand the actual account of what transpired under slavery they, their response is to, well, not all slaves were treated like that. Oh, slaves are like a car. Why would you damage a car? It was a valuable possession, which is a really disgusting analogy that I hear all too often from, from um, slavery apologists um, and, planta- and plantation fanatics. Um, you know, they, even though you have these accounts, how, how, you know, how gnarly and how vicious and violent slavery was and how Jim Crow and the redemption period in the South, how dangerous that was, how deadly that was. Even if, even though we got newspapers that they wrote, they still are, they don't want to lean into the shame that they feel and they should feel shame. You should feel, we all feel shame. We, like that's a human, that's a human feeling. You should, it's going to lead. It's not going it, to like, and they had this thing where, where am I hearing? Um, what do we hear from the, the, the parents that come into city council? I don't want my kids grow up feeling guilty. Well, guilt that's on you. Um, but, but sh- feeling empathy and shame and, and a level of, a level of empathy or sympathy. That's okay for your kids to feel that. Like, like that, that one tweet that went out, uh, a weeks ago, you know, if, if, and I'm, I'm going to summarize it because I don't have it. But if, if, if Ruby Bridges can survive walking to school with National Guard, armed National Guard men, if she can survive at, a, at her, that young, tender age that we all we all have that picture of of um, of um, did I say Ruby D? I meant Ruby Bridges. I hope I didn't say Ruby D. But Ruby Bridges, we all have that 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 picture of Ruby, a young Ruby Bridges walking to school with her little socks and her little bow in her hair and her little cardigan and her dress. 
with the you know the norm even the, what Norman Rockwell even depicted I think right walking to school under the under the protection of the National Guard if she can survive that survive people who literally want to kill her then your your student your your kids can learn about that history about your granddaddy who was probably in that crowd seriously like seriously right y'all are lighting it up I love it we're gonna get to that too there's there's another conversation about Harry T Burley that talks about that complexity um they talk about charleston and they talk about like i love the way the thread that this guy i'm gonna let him explain it but but yeah yeah let me um but let me play a little bit more here from this uh soprano and um uh what she's talking about his work and how what she finds beautiful about harry t burlow's work and then we're gonna transition to another clip about an audio clip about his work some colorings that just kind of pull on your heartstrings a little bit. For me, I am an H.T. Burley art song fan, for sure. Well, I think we know him and think about him most because of his arrangements of the spirituals, right? And right. his art songs have actually been really neglected, I would say. In See, so he has art songs, and this is something, um, Fletcher and I talked about this, um, very briefly, um, just via text, uh, you'll know Fletcher Williams, a fine artist here in Charleston. He talked about like how like he, f well, let me, I don't want to, I don't want to mischaracterize what he shared with me. And, and I don't think it's privileged, but um, uh, basically talked about frustration and just being seen as a black artist and expected to, to deliver work that confronts race every time. Like, no, I, I actually want to do some other stuff. Like, hey, how about I, you know, how about I, I, I create something abstract, right? You know, maybe, 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 maybe Fletcher wanted to do something like with, with, a, with a cubist bent to it or whatever, right? Maybe he wants to do landscapes. I don't know. But he wanted the freedom to express himself. And what I gathered from that, that brief exchange that we had, he wanted to express himself artistically and not be confined to just race. And I think, too, with Harry T. Burley is that what, what these artists helped me see is that his work was way more than just Negro spirituals, right? It was not just, you know, what we typically assign to black artistic expression. It's something that, and that's something that we're not afforded even like, even me, like some people, I saw when my popularity started to wane, of course it was white fatigue um, with talking about race and the way that I talk about it very directly. A lot of white folks just really not really didn't really feel it over a sustained period of time. That was one thing. But the other thing that people didn't like about what I glean that people didn't like from, from what I, what I do is that I don't just stay, I don't, I don't simplify race. I talk about it in a nuanced way. I talk about how, how things show up in environmentalism, in art in culture, right? Thank you for the new follow. I appreciate you so much. Um, and, um, I talk about, I transcend it. And sometimes I want to talk about symphonies. You talking to a girl that in high school took her boo to Charleston Pops, okay? Like, that was me. I love I love piano music. I love orchestra uh, orchestra music. I love symphonies. I love it. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, I ain't an aficionado or nothing like that, but I, I love a good, classy event, right? Um, and a lot of what I really encountered, and not to center me, we're going to center Harry T. Burley, um, but, but a lot of things that I encountered with, with white resistance to my work is that it's not purely just rage and invective and anger people i saw people becoming way too uh reliant on me showing up angry right and filled with rage and when i wanted to be a little bit softer and pinker if i wanted to be a little bit i wanted to lean into my interests that transcend hip-hop and blues and jazz and r&b and blackity black like when i did that that's when people really got confused like wait a minute no 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 no. you're supposed to fit in this box so i can only imagine imagine like artists um composers painters sculptors i can only imagine the limitations that they also um were confined by because people's lack of black white white supremacy's lack of imagination when it comes to to black artistic expression right so i can only imagine that so we're going to talk about his art I, i'm learning more about his art songs i'm going to seek out his art his art songs more and not just the spirituals and and his i guess that the spirituals and that impact that it had on antonin dvorak connect in relation to the spirituals i've sung a lot of his spirituals 
but I've recently heard so many of his songs that are just stunning. Alicia Fox, who's one of the young artists I love this conversation. at LA Opera, programmed his uh, Till I Wake and Among the Fuchsias, and I was just, this is that. beautiful, you know? So I'm dying. There's so much learning. There's so much music. I'm dying to sing. So that's that's on my list. I didn't know his songs before, and now I've been listening, yeah. and they're just so many really beautiful ones. We know him so much for his spirituals, and he was so much more than that. Harry Burley was a dedicated church musician throughout his life, beginning as a young man in Erie, where he sang in the choirs of the Cathedral of Saint Paul's. Thank you, the Nicole. Park Presbyterian Church and the Reformed Jewish Temple. However, Burley's passion for music extended beyond the sacred. In his late teens, he was so determined to hear a salon recital by Hungarian pianist Raphael Josephi at the home of local music lover and his mother sometimes employer, Elizabeth Russell, he stood outside in the snow to listen and became ill. After revealing the cause of his illness to his mother, she asked Russell to hire Burley as a doorman since he would not have been welcomed as a guest at Russell's racially segregated events, so he could attend the performances without fear for his health. This afforded Burley the opportunity to hear many well-known classical performers such as Venezuelan pianist Teresa Carreño and Italian See, tenor Italo Campanini. So somebody like let him, I, I know this, this the, the name of the book sounds, in it, in, in, it's intentional and in sounding, um, um, very uh, controversial, but uh, it very the spook who sat by the door. If you ever read that book, I, I advise all my white folk to read that book or go on YouTube and watch the watch the bootleg version on YouTube as I've already downloaded it so I can have it in perpetuity. But um, uh, the spook who sat by the door is all about uh, a black uh, revolutionary who goes through the CIA. I think it's C yeah, CIA uh, rises through the ranks just so he can kind of like liberate secrets from the government to help liberate black people in the ghetto. Right. But basically putting himself in a position to excel, um, intellectually and physically, uh, so he can, you know, excel throughout the, the ranks of the CIA to learn how the government works and to learn the government's, um, the government's plans for black America, which is of course really fucked up. But he he learns all these things by being on the inside and then comes out and tries to, you know, formulate, um, you know, mount a revolution. And it sounds like Harry T. Burley and being people understand, understood his brilliance and brought him in in so many different ways. And he bore witness to all of this amazing uh, European um, work and art. Um, and that's very powerful to be put in that position. And I would challenge white people either listening here or those who, who listen later. I encourage you all to to find ways to 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 to, to do that, but in a safe way. Like just don't bring black people into predominantly white spaces without a plan for care um, and safety. Right. But what would it look like for you to bring black people um, or give black people entree into spaces that have been prohibited, have been closed to them, right? In 1892, at the age of 26, Burley received a scholarship to the National Conservatory. Look familiar of music if you're Europe. watching. The years Burley spent at the conservatory greatly influenced his career, mostly due to his association and friendship with, with Antonin, Antonin Dvorak, Dvorak, the conservatory's director. After spending countless hours recalling and performing the African-American spirituals and plantation songs he had Thank learned you, from his maternal grandfather for Dvorak, Burley was encouraged to preserve these melodies in his own compositions. In turn, Dvorak wrote themes inspired by the songs introduced to him by Burley in his Symphony No. 9 in E minor, also known as From the New World. In addition, Burley served as copyist for Dvorak, a task that prepared him for his future responsibilities as a music editor. Uh, a unique thing about Mr. Burley is that he also worked for the Recordy Publishing Company. Mm -hmm. They had an office here in New York, and he worked for them. And, um, and so a lot of his stuff was published by Mr. Recordy, I believe, and I think a lot of his stuff is in the Recordy archives in Milan now. Mm. You know, um, 
He's very generous with his time and his advocacy. He was very much known as uh, very being very supportive, in particular of women composers. I it got my hands on a letter that he wrote Florence Price, wow. encouraging her, and um, she wanted some songs, uh, see if some songs could be published. But at that time, it wasn't a good time because of the economy, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And so he was very supportive of women composers like Florence Price, Undine Smith Moore, you know, um, part of his career, major part of his career was mentoring young musicians, That's especially amazing. singers and composers. Pay it for it, pay it for it. So I'm going to stop it there and I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and look up his art songs. I wanted to get to this other, we listened to the, the, this is what, when I met that guy on the battery, I found this, this NPR piece that we listened to at the beginning, right, from 2018. But there was another one, right? So not just so the how, how the New World Symphony introduced American music to itself. Well, I love that title. Um, but there was this other piece that I just discovered in preparation for today's live stream. Um, and this is entitled, this is from NPR. This is from even further back, 2006. Um, do y'all like how I say that? I got to stop saying it. I think it is weird, 2006. I always say that. <laughs> 2008. <laughs> 2013. 2013 works. But anyway, um, <laughs> but back in 2006, um, should I say the early aughts? Is that it? Is that correct? <laughs> music, music among friends, uh, Burley and Diversion. I thought this was very helpful because um, all it talks also about. Uh, <sighs> did it? Wait, 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 wait. Let me make sure. Let me make sure. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Nope, this is it right here. <laughs> this is it. Nah, it was a, nah, nah, nah. This one is good too. Music among friends. Go ahead and, and read this. Listen to this. That's fine. But no, no, <clears throat> it was this one. Will. Is it Liverman's um, Dream of a, of a New Day for Black Composers? Now, this is recent. This is from February 2021. Okay, this one. I did listen to this one. Hey, NPR. Ugh. In Wisdom from the Top, Ed. host Guy Raz invites you Ed. to listen in as he talks to the visionary short, leaders though. of some of the world's biggest brands. Click the play button below to hear a recent episode. Okay, it's an ad. But yeah, we're going to get to it. I got you in the chat, 20 <laughs> Right for you. You can now get free one-on-one -on -one help from experienced Thank you, hosts. Go to airbnb.com slash ask a super host. This is the song for the genius child. Sing it softly, for the song is mine. Yo, drop in the chat, though, if you ever, like, do y'all really doing, like, do y'all really dig into black orchestral or black symphonic excellence if y'all not doing that i don't know what you're doing put it on y'all go ask your smart speaker to start playing some of these black composers that we talked about today i think you'll be better for it and it's gonna really like i'm telling you today is a day of just like rest and just i'm just gonna soothe myself by listening to some dope music and reading um the trouble with white women i know that sounds like that's not restful but it, it will be Will Liverman is a young baritone Liverman. with a mission. He wants to expose listeners to music that he thinks doesn't get programmed enough in concert halls or on classical radio stations. His new album is called Dreams of a New Day, songs by black composers. In school, I never was really taught a lot about these composers. It's just from all experience and, and listening to these composers along the way, whether it's something on YouTube or a colleague that, that sang a piece that I really liked. Liked. So it really is to highlight black composers who are significant. And, you know, I'm a big believer and supporter of, of new works in the classical field. So I commissioned Shano Pebolo to do two black churches. Aww, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That just sent chills down my. I got goose flesh. Legit. Mm. And march the streets of ask you about two black churches. I'm glad you, you brought it up. Please, if you would, tell us what is it about? 
My dad, you know, he grew up in Virginia and he would tell me stories of, you know, his time growing up in, in the South and growing up with coloreds and whites and ha having to be escorted to the back of the bus. And that just sent me down this path of looking through civil rights things. And I ran across this poem called Ballad of Birmingham. Um, which talks about the Birmingham bombing from the perspective of one Listen, of the girls who wants to, you know, go out and march. I'm giving y'all praise. I must just say again, thank y'all so much for the support. I don't take it for granted. Um, y'all are really important to me. I talked about it yesterday. Um, I talked about it yesterday evening too. Shout out to my girl Hillary. Um, we hung out yesterday and we talked. I talked at length, of course. If you ever get me one on one, I talk a lot. Duh. That's why I got a podcast on the live stream. But seriously, y'all been really pouring into me in ways that y'all don't even know. It, it's very lonesome to live in Charleston. It's a very lonesome feeling. Um, sometimes it feels the void of culture. It feels the void of community. And y'all are really, like, seriously, the little cheers and the bits and, and all that. I love it. I love that y'all leaning into Twitch and learning how to use it. I appreciate you. Um, I stopped it there for a point of emphasis, too. I want you to listen to. I'm going to, usually the copy matches up with what, <clears throat> yeah, the, usually the copy matches up with, um, yeah, with the audio here on NPR. That's what I like about NPR. Um, you can listen, which you can also read. So I want to read this for emphasis, and I'm going to let it play again. Um, so I, I want to ask you about the two black churches. So that's a, that's a piece. Two black churches, right? Um, uh, and they, they reference uh, Marcus Amaker here in this piece as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about two black churches uh, in, the, in the world. In the words of, um, let me see. Oh, Charleston's former, he's no longer the poet laureate? Oh, former poet laureate Marcus Amaker. Uh, what goes through your mind when you're singing that piece, right? Okay. So Marcus Amaker's not a, a composer, though. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to, not, no, no shade, no, 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 no shade, I'm not shading, nothing like that. Shout out, Marcus. Shout out, Marcus. Called Ballad of Birmingham. I saw I want to get, okay, yeah, I'm going to go back a little bit, skosh more. I want to ask you about two black churches. I'm glad you, you brought it up. Please, if you would, tell us, what is it about? My dad, you know, he grew up in Virginia and he would tell me stories of, you know, his time growing up in, in the South and growing up with coloreds and whites and ha having to be escorted to the back of the bus. And that just sent me down this path of looking through civil rights things. And I ran across this poem called Ballad of Birmingham. Um, which talks about the Birmingham bombing from the perspective of one of the girls who wants to, you know, go out and march and fight for justice and equality, but her mom keeps telling her, no, you know, it's too dangerous. Go to church instead and sing in the choir where it's safe. And of course, in the end, it, it, it isn't safe. And I asked Sean to set music to it. And then he had the idea to sort of do a parallel of the Birmingham bombing to the Charleston shooting mm. to just show how much we still go through as black people and, and still fighting for justice, still having to deal with uh, white supremacy and the hatred. over something so beautiful i didn't mean to curse over something so so okay in the copy let me see what y'all saying in the copy of this of what y'all listening to if you're not looking um it, it, the the copy reads is, is not it's not a uh, word for word it says i want to ask you about two black churches and that's italicized it's the name of the work two black churches the words in this work are by charleston's former poet laureate marcus amaker uh, what goes through your mind when you're singing that piece is what she asked. Please, if you would tell us. And he went on to talk about his dad. Thank you all so much for the cheers. Um, he went on to talk about his dad growing up in the segregated South. Right. And so I'm like, but but when you listen to it, they don't say Marcus Amaker's name. Right. Like I, I admittedly listened to this this morning and it wasn't reading it. So then I look up. I didn't know this. So two black churches, colon, Ballad of Birmingham slash the rain. So Marcus Amaker. 
He what? That means he sang, right? Librettus? Is that or is that the what does that word mean? Hype train. Look at y'all. Hold up. Copy. I ain't like I ain't like most people. If I don't know a word. Oh, it wrote. Okay. The text of an opera. Okay. So I didn't know that. Okay, so Marcus's Okay, Ballad of Birmingham is by Dadley, Dudley Randall. Got it. And then The Rain is by Marcus Amaker. So Two Black Churches is a combination of that. Is the Okay, the juxtaposition, or rather the, the parallels between the Birmingham bombing that killed four little black girls in Birmingham, Alabama, right, and then the Charleston shooting. That's interesting. That's an interesting tie. Okay, let's proceed. Thank you so much, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and it struck me train. so hard because I grew up with a heavy church background. It's something that's just so personal to me because I think about my own church family and if something like that were to happen or if I was a victim, just going out to church on a Tuesday night and you think you're safe is a you know, place of peace and, and comfort is just so devastating. Let me ask you about some of the older compositions on Dreams of a New Day by a composer named Henry Burley. Who was Henry Burley and and how did he end up on this album? The way that he set Negro spirituals in a classical way gave black classical singers a platform to, you know, have solo recitals and solo careers. And he just did so much for the culture and so much for black classical music. But he also wrote a lot of great songs. So I I definitely had to have his song cycle, Five Songs of Lawrence Hope. Um, you know, he's a very prominent composer, has done a lot of great orchestral works. And Dvorak and Burley met in New York. Henry Burley introduced Dvorak to spirituals and black music, which then influenced Dvorak's writing. Um, so it's just, you know, little things like that that I want to bring to the forefront, that these black composers really did a lot. When, when I was a kid and my dad wanted to punish us, he would make us sit in the corner and listen to Dvorak. Like, we weren't allowed to read. Or, yes. And so I had no idea that he and Henry Burley were contemporaries. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. This project was a true labor of love. I mean, I started singing opera at age 13 when I was in the governor's school and and high school. Yeah, yeah. And I just don't really hear so many works by black composers. So this album was was just very important to have something behind for people to listen to and, and get to know these composers and research them. You've made me very curious. Tell me about being a 13-year-old boy who sings opera. Were you considered a strange child? <laughs> <laughs> Look, my parents were like, opera, what's going on? <laughs> you know, that program in Norfolk, Virginia, Governor's School for the Arts, shout out to Virginia Beach in Norfolk. Mm. Um, mm. I grew up with a, a big, heavy gospel background. I didn't know anything about opera, and I grew up with piano as well. It wasn't until I, I got to high school I auditioned for this program and I, I didn't know what this program was at the time. I thought it was going to be like a like a R&B, you know, <laughs> sort of school where we learn like mainstream songs. And I look on the list and the audition is like, sing one Italian art song or, or like the national anthem as you're I'm like, Italian? I don't know, Italian from French, from gibberish, from, you know. So I, I sing the national anthem and I got in and that was that. That was the start of my classical journey. Listen to this next question coming up. I appreciate y'all so much. Y'all are so dope. Will Liverman, his new album is called Dreams of a New Day, Songs I'm by I'm going to ask the next question. It's- oh, I thought it was going to be in the audio. It's not. Again, the copy does not match up directly with the audio. Let me read it to you for those who are, who are listening and not watching along. 
or reading along says, how would you feel about white singers performing the music of black composers? Are we at that point yet? Ooh, Vanilla Ice. Somebody said Vanilla Ice earlier. Somebody said Madonna earlier. Let me stop. <laughs> so he, so, uh, excuse me. Will Lieberman said, Lieberman said, excuse me. I think so. Right. Maybe not the spirituals. Ooh, good segue. Right. So the question was like, how do you feel about white people singing? singing this performing this music he says i you know are we there at that point he said he thinks so maybe not the spirituals because of the significance and the history behind it mm. <laughs> behind it but definitely black art songs again remember harry t burley seems like it seems like all of these black composers and singers and you know um these classically trained artists really um, they really appreciate the black art song from Harry T. Burley, not just the spirituals, right? <clears throat> but the and that's what they're advocating for: the advocacy of this, 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 uh, of this music that is at the bedrock of black music here in, in in the in America, right? So he says that maybe not the spiritual, right? Don't be doing that spiritual, spiritual stuff, right? So to, that's a good segue, right? Let me just go. Let me read a little bit more. Okay, not just the spiritual, maybe the maybe the black art songs. I think this is what makes it normal, right? This is how we make it something. I guess he means maybe mainstream. This is how we make it something that's not like, oh, let's make a concert featuring black composers. Exactly to to that point, like let black people create and not don't let them don't always um, call upon them to create art that directs that directly confronts white supremacy, racism, injustice, like, damn it. Can we also relax? Can we also talk about being in love? Can we also talk about our, our queer identities in our art? Can we also talk about, you know, whatever, whatever we want to talk about. Can we talk about, you know, a fond memory? Like, like that's the one thing too about Charleston that I'm trying to get them to divest from. I'm trying to get some black folk to stop giving it out, which is like, I'm not here to help you understand white supremacy. I don't exist uh, as a teacher or agree out to teach you about white supremacy. I know that's what I do here, but that's specific. If you ever meet me in person, you'll learn real quick. That ain't my whole fucking life. Right. And so I'm trying to get a white Charleston and those who are powerful in Charleston to divest from black people only being a source of, Hey, when I want to make this shit, uh, <laughs> thank y'all so much. for this <laughs> Hype train. When I want to make this, um, you know, when I want to acknowledge racism, I want to just have a, a gospel brunch or something like that instead of actually addressing issues from from a systemic um, from a systemic uh, place. Um, thank y'all so much. I appreciate the support over here. The hype train, all are dope. Um, oh, that's why I don't see this. Oh, share. I'll share it. Yeah. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, but yeah, I, 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 um, but the black spiritual, let me get back to my point. Cause I went on and on, but I, I do think that we require black people to show up and just be, to be black. And I'm tired. I, I, I stopped answering those requests where you want me to come up just to confront racism. And I know I, I have a space here where we do that, but that's very specific. And also it's not, it's not all day. It's two to three hours of a specific issue. Um, tomorrow we'll be talking about white women and like uh influence the culture we're going to dig into things about that whole southern i'm going to i'm going to talk a little bit about southern charm tomorrow but i'm going to extend that conversation to talk about whiteness too like and this is the, this is the thing about white this is the thing about charleston white charleston is they refuse to examine their whiteness and to unpack their whiteness they constantly want black people to show up and tell you a thing or two but you like half the time like i'm just waiting for y'all to just sit down and say you know what I read this book. I read either whether the trouble with black or the me, trouble with white women or a black woman's history uh, of America. Right. I want like I, I want to start seeing white people have these conversations about how they have perpetuated white supremacy as opposed to always needing a black person to be a magical Negro or Negress um, and, and teach those lessons. Right. Anyway, getting back to the art, getting back to the art, getting back to the art. So he was like, nah, don't, I don't know why people singing them spirituals. So I, of course that made me bust out. Did Marvisi's garden. If you will turn to, to our hymn. This is our hymn. No, this is our, this is our, no, no, this is our biblical text. If you want to live in Charleston before you, when you, when you get your keys to your house or you get your keys to your apartment, uh, they should be handing out copies of this book. If you want to live in Charleston. Anyway, page 214 
says this, like starts talking about SPS, right? Let me, I want to get to the origins of SPS. So, so SPS was, um, the spiritual group of all white people. Um, and they sung Negro spirituals and they were like, Oh, well, black people don't sing it as good as they should. So we're going to take it from them. And then what they did was, this is a very, very, very rough synopsis. But what they did was they created an, an entire industry, which barred black people from performing their own culture. <laughs> um, and basically made it prohibitive and basically said that the only legit legitimate spirituals come from the SPS, which is, um, SPS is society for the preservation of spirituals. So very paternalistic, right? Very paternalistic. And I, Oh, look, look, a uh, Hayward was involved, right? Um, Janie Hay Hayward, right? So yeah, the most include, let me just read this. The most acclaimed wardens, of the whitewash soundscape of slavery rose to prominence at the same time Janie Hayward uh, was enjoying her popularity. Founded in the fall of 1922, the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals, or SPS, included Hayward's son. Oh, is it really? H is Hayward's son, DeBose. Hmm. The guy that wrote Porgy and Bess. <laughs> So when I go on and on about how, like, I don't really feel Porgy and Bess like that. And I got a lot of blowback when I started saying this. Got a lot of blowback from black people who, like, I'm, like look, black people have been performing Porgy and Bess forever. Right? And they've been reinventing it, re reimagining it forever because it was problematic. Um, not because it was, like, it's not perfect. It's written by white. But that, I, I kind of forgot, y'all. I kind of forgot that the Bose Hayward who wrote Porgy and Bess, his mama was Janie Hayward. Oh, that I definitely, I definitely, definitely don't like Porgy and Bess. I'm sorry, I just, Porgy and Bess do not excite me, unless it's, 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 it, it's, it's reimagined to confront the issues. But let me read this again. The most acclaimed wardens of the whitewashed soundscape of slavery rose to prominence at the same time Jamie, Janie Hayward was enjoying her popularity founded in the fall of 1922 the society for the preservation of spirituals or sps included hayward's son dubose and sam stoney um, as well as scions of other prominent low country families such as the balls ravenels drayton's porchers smiths or smiths pinkneys grim keys and huge is a hugies if it's a person is if the family is a hugie right all right okay reared on plantations, but now residing in Charleston, these homesick writers, lawyers, and bankers started meeting each other's homes, meeting at each other's homes to sing Gullah spiritual. These white folk, y'all, these rich white folk. Oh, I miss, I miss Dixie. Let's get the bows. Go sing that Gullah spiritual that, that the, the darkies used to sing at the porch at night. <laughs> So they used to get together, y'all, meet up at the house in Charleston and be like, yo, yo, let's start, let's do our own vanilla ice impersonation. It was like, yeah, bet. True. All right, let's do it. Initially, little more than a, let me read back to the text. <laughs> Initially, little more than a private social club, the SPS quickly evolved into an organization that focused on performing and preserving spirituals for the broader public. Think Kim K., um, making um, black women's aesthetics popular. Think that white woman making black women's aesthetics popular, right? Only do only on a white body though. Although the 47 founding members of the SPS have, uh, have been born after the civil war. Most of them met the essential requirements of being the descendants in quotation, the descendants of plantation owners and slave owners. That was a requirement. You had to own slave. Your granddaddy had to own slaves for you to, to be an SPS. And the reason why I'm reading this now, y'all, the reason why I think it was important to lift this up now is because, um, yeah, D, I see your comment, the wardens of the whitewash. That's a fucking phrase right there. Um, the reason why I'm reading this now is because again, how do we lift up the the artistry? How do we lift up lift up this um, uh, brilliance of these composers and these works and these singers and these performers, um, and center their experience and center their brilliance and not traffic in the same foolishness that Hayward and those did by saying, "Oh, we discovered this thing now we own it." Like this, there's a there's also another reflex with whiteness to own everything that is great, right? To feel entitled to ownership, 
to feel entitled to, to, to having some sort of also having some sort of financial stake and monetizing it. Um, you know, as, as opposed to lifting it up and, and like, I feel like Dvorak did, I feel like Antonin did that. He's like, this thing is dope. I want to elevate it. I don't want to own it out right now. Again, that whiteness popped up when you start, you know, writing stuff that sound a little bit like weighed in the water or whatever. You know what I mean? But anyway, the, the, the gnarly, the real gnarly part is how they really kept black people out of like, they would not let black people eat. They kept blocking the bag. And y'all know how I feel about blocking bags. Come on now. We, I don't even block the influencers bags down here. I, I don't like that. I don't like that. All right. Let me get to what else I wanted to play. This is really like calming me down in the way that I really needed to. Um, oh yeah. So I want to do this. <laughs> So I wanted to play. So last year, because of COVID, the Charleston Symphony, they did. I kind of want to talk about how like they fumbled the bag a little bit. They fumbled, they fumbled a moment. Charleston never misses a moment to fumble a moment to have to even like posture like they're having a uh, racial reckoning. All right. So. Last year was supposed to be like the big celebration, 350 years of Charleston. And I was like, I was watching like, okay, 350 years of what? Uh huh. What are we talking about? Cause out of that 350 years is a big thing called slavery there. <laughs> and while that wasn't the only thing happening in 350 years of Charleston's history, that was the thing. All right. So, um, there was this piece back in 2019, the Charleston symphony helps, uh, helps the city celebrate, uh, 350 years this is from the city paper. Right. So I started digging into that. Right. And of course, CVB stuff came up. Some CVB stuff came up and this is the CVB. Y'all know I don't go to explore Charleston's website like that. I don't go to Charleston CVB's website. Um, not, not if I can help, I try to avoid it. So back, I think last year, Oh no, no, this was the 13th. Uh, this is 2013. Excuse me. The Charleston chamber orchestra series opened, with, uh, I guess they revisited a couple times, revisited, um, uh, opens with a musical, uh, serenades that feature woodwind string sections of our orchestra, highlighting the talents of our musician. Then it goes on to say two works of, um, Mozart. And then they do, um, Anton Dvorak's enchanting serenade for strings. Right. And I was looking for them to lift up like, and, um, did I say Anton? Antonin. I was looking for them to look, lift up Antonin Dvorak's uh, work with black spirituals. Um, I didn't see that. I see Mozart. But then, um, anyway, so then I did find that the Charleston Symphony, they took off the orchestra. Um, they used to be CSO, but I think they still go by CSO, but they don't go, they don't say it. They, they're Charleston Orchestra. Um, so, I mean, Charleston Symphony. So they did this performance because of COVID. It was all virtual. And let me read the caption. So it's, um, this is the Charleston Symphony performs an excerpt from Dvorak's New World Symphony remotely. Let's see the caption. Let's see if they talk about the complexity of it. Again, this is for, uh, so it says April 18th. Our community will celebrate and commemorate 350 years since the founding of Charleston due to COVID crisis, Charleston Symphony's season finale, which was set to be part of Charleston's 350th anniversary celebration had been canceled. However, we still want to play our part by bringing our community together through music. That's so cute on this momentous occasion to mark this anniversary, along with the release of previously recorded live performances of Dvorak's new world symphony, Symphony musicians of CSO have prepared a special selection from the works famous movement. All right. So now this is what they put. This is under, like if you go to their Vimeo or here on YouTube, it says Antonin uh, Dvorak came to the, came to the new world to mentor its composers, finding a voice of their own, a musical identity. That's purely American. His ninth symphony was the crown jewel of his work based on the sounds he found to be inherently American. The, I'm waiting to get to the black part. The folk music of its native and African citizens, African-American citizens, the symphony is, see, it's just a blurb. It's just a blurb. That's, they always do that. 
They always do that. You, you, y'all get what I'm trying. What I'm trying to say, like, it's always just a blurb. It's just like a a, a footnote when it's actually like it, when you read from like quotes from Dvorak. Let me open up my quotes from him again. Again, you know, he told white people directly um, that uh, white Americans, uh, that the future of their music resided in the people that they subjugated, and, subjugated and killed. Um, this came from the NPR piece again. Dvorak chose a black person to be his assistant, Harry T. Burla, Burla, excuse me, from Erie, Pennsylvania, self-taught baritone, right? He, he sought him out. All right. Burley claimed that Dvorak was actually quoting like and, and he influenced Dvorak's work. Right. Dvorak recognized a rich tradition sitting under his nose, one that most American composers seem blind to. He wove American roots music into his vast symphonic canvas. Right. Our culture influenced the world is what I wrote. Right. Negro spirituals. I wrote this, I think. Um, Negro spirituals is American music. It is the root of American music and steeped in a rich tradition, right? So I think when you divorce that radical element of Antonin Dvorak's work, when you divorce it, you divorce his work from that radical element, from its roots, from his reaction to, to, um, to Negro spirituals, I think, and they don't do it like that bad. I'm, I'm just being a little picky, um, but it's always a blurb when it should be the lead. But we're going to listen. We're going to listen because we, you know, I mean, we fuck, we fuck with symphonies. We gonna listen, <laughs> right, right. Um, D, I see you. All right, so this is just an excerpt. We, one day I'm gonna do a whole poor game best situation. I'm gonna do a whole poor game best like thing because we gonna. I didn't. I really did not put that together that that uh, Hayward, Debose Hayward. Um, I'm gonna get to it. All right. Influence. Now be quiet. Ain't no black people. Wait. <laughs> this is beautiful, though. I do too. pretty I don't know about that <laughs> I don't know about that yeah I ain't wishing Charleston that. I love Charleston but mm, we gotta collect this sometimes um oh I wanted to play this I wanted to play this let me um So this is Harry T. Burlow and his um, his uh, collaboration with him and Dvorak here. And, and there is a third name that I don't know how to pronounce that looks like appears to be Czech as well, because we know Antonin Dvorak is Czech. Um, but again, l this is listen to the this is European. But Harry T. Burlow contributed to this. You don't think of black 
you, you, we're not led to think of this as black music or black having black influence over it, but it quite literally does. And so we have to start complicating people's relationship with the traditionally very whitewash um, world of like, I guess, orchestral music or symphonic, con- you know, symphonic selections. We have to complicate that relationship if it's all monolithically white, we have to understand that there are other influences. And and I I would definitely like to assume it probably is way more than just black influences. We already know that Antonin Dvorak also um, lifted up uh, contributions from contributions from indigenous music as well. Um, So you can only imagine, um, you can only imagine the influence that all these cultures and so many other cultures had that were not white that had on, on music that we, typically view as white, right? So we're trying to reconnect um, our culture with uh, some mainstream culture. Mainstream in air quotes. <laughs> our culture isn't mainstream. Hello, I'm Tanya Tompkins, Artistic Director of Valley of the Moon Music Festival. And I'm Eric Zivian, Music Director. And for today's concert, we're truly reaching across the distance with a production all the way from Boston, filmed by Christos Vianis. Yes, thank you, Christos, for doing this. This um, concert is called Collaboration. It's a really interesting program, and we would love for you to learn more about it by listening to two incredible um, Blattner lecturers. The first one, Christine Brandes, she's a soprano, and she's interviewing um, the baritone in this program, Dashaun Burton, in a very interesting conversation about Harry Burley's um, relationship with Dvorak and for... So it would be great, like, so for for Charleston's 350th celebration, it would have been great for me to see. And y'all saw it, for those who are watching, you saw, uh, shout out to the Charleston Symphony. Like, I'm, I'm not I'm not coming at you, but we, we come at you at the, you know, this is a call-in, so it is what it is. I'm, so, like, it would have been great to see more diverse, contra- like, diverse professionals um, be a part of that, performance that two minute and seven second performance is they'll all be in an excerpt but like how hard would it be for you to enlist perhaps um uh you know a a a singer (laughs) um or as any black or brown contributors and there was there were some other faces of color in that but not a lot um in that montage but more in that in that performance rather um but it's okay to like, just want to Charleston. It's okay to center black. It's okay to center black people. It doesn't always have to be only call us with when it's uh, Moja festival time or, you know, when it's the MLK brunch or, you know, when it's the emancipation day parade, it's okay to talk to us, uh, uh, you know, engage us in other works um, that don't explicitly, you know, talk about race and racism. It just would have been great an even more in-depth lecture about the subject. Uh, We have (laughs) the incredible Alex Ross from The New Yorker as one of our other Blattner lecturers to give a more in-depth talk about it. And we really encourage you to check those out. And today, two musicians are making their Valley of the Moon Music Festival debuts. Uh, First is Stashan, the singer, whom Tanya already mentioned. And then we have Renana Gutmann on the piano, uh, joining our old favorite, Audrey Vardanaga. And a special thank you to Sandra Schlesinger for underwriting Dashaun's appearance with Valley of the Moon Music Festival. Ooh. And we hope you enjoy the concert. Get that back. Please come to the Zoom reception afterwards. <laughs> a Zoom reception. <laughs> Never. <laughs> this world has changed. COVID has changed us. feel what you make or feel what you perform like this. (laughs) This is what I look like when I play chopsticks.
you see that D? Fast forward to Deshaun's, Deshaun coming in. This is beautiful. Also, I want to pause it. Like y'all watching, watching their, their um, mannerisms. They're, they're, they're reading the music. It looks like they're reading the music off of um, tablets. So it was just interesting to see them instead of turning the page. Like I, like you, like you would typically imagine turning the page. They just tap the screen to the next one. It's just, we just live in a different world now. It's just it's just really dope to see like technology and younger like younger performers or performers of color um or different backgrounds perform these things. Um it just it just looks different. I'm just noticing this. So now Biblical Songs, this was by Antonin Dvorak. Um they played some I think they I don't know if that piece I didn't remember the card before that, if that piece was um collaboration with Harry T. Burla. Burley. But anyway, this is Antonin Dvorak. Again, we know that he was influenced heavily by biblical by, by Negro spirituals. This is called Biblical Songs, written in 1894, performed by Deshaun um, Burton, who's a baritone, just like Harry T. Burley was. Burley was. <laughs> okay, we're going to play this. I would love to see stuff like this in Charleston. And not just during Spoleto. Listen to his voice. I'm going to be quiet.
I put myself on mute to resist the urge to keep talking over beautiful compositions. Uh, same facade. Thanks. Shout out to you and um, Auntie Blur, y'all. Make it, and Little Mama, <laughs> your proximity to a, a musical performer. I appreciate that. I knew I had a gifted community over here. I knew it. Okay, so one thing I wanted to finish up with. Let me see, make sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to read a little bit from here. This is from the the Dvorak um, American Heritage Society. Um, I wanted to read from here, but I first and foremost because it talks more about that con- uh, that that collaboration with Harry T. Burle uh, and and uh, Antonin Dvorak. But I wanted to lift up this uh, piece that I found uh, written in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I found on Jaster. Y'all know I love a good, a good report, study, dissertation. The invisibility and fame of Harry T. Burley, retrospect and prospect by Samuel A. Floyd Jr. April t- uh, April second, two thousand and three, saw the opening of a three day conference, the heritage and legacy of Harry T. Burley who was born 1866, y'all. He pres- passed away in 1949. Oh, my, my mom and my dad's uh, lifetime. Um, designed to address and celebrate con- con- oh, excuse me, contributions of, his, of the singer, composer, vocal coach, pianist, teacher, editor, and producer. The presenters explored issues ranging from who influenced Burley's career to whom he influenced, from his musical prowess to his work as a composer, from his arranging to his singing. And we, I'm going to pause there so we learn more about his art songs that I'm really going to dive into once I conclude here this morning. And I invite you all to, to do your research on that as well. Um, okay, yeah, let me read that again. The presenters explored issues ranging from who Burley's career, who influenced Burley's career, to whom he influenced, from his musical prowess uh, to his work as a composer, from his arranging to his singing, from his songs to his choral works, from his spirituals to his popular and concert music. This, this occasion was the first to address comprehensively so many aspects of this individual's career and to provide interpretations that reach beneath the surface of previous writings to support his status as a key figure in the history of American music, For over the decades, discussions of his contributions to American music have been virtually absent uh, in the in the tombs uh, uh, that that document and extol that history. Let me read that again. Right. Let me read that again. Because that was really important. That that feels like Charleston, like over and over and over and over and over again. All right. I'm going to read it again. So this is specifically about Harry T. Burley, but you can probably, uh, uh, you know, affix somebody else's name here, another black or brown contributor to art and culture. This occasion was the first to address comprehensively so many aspects of this individual's career and to provide interpretations that reach beneath the surface of previous writings to support his status as a key figure in the history of American music. For over the decades, discussions of his contributions to American music have been virtually absent in the tombs that document and extol that history. There are acceptable reasons for this silence, including the fact that until recently, there have, ex- there have existed serious gaps in our knowledge about African-American music and musicians and a dearth <laughs> of the kind of information <laughs> that would reveal Burla, Burley's, uh, that would reveal Burley as even um, semi-significant in the history of American music. In fact, in the large majority of cases, Burley's name does not appear unless Antonin de Verjac does. And that's, see, that's the, that's the rub. So when we talk about Charleston history, we talk about SPS, talk about that paternalistic um that paternalistic and, and, and just outright white supremacist, um, uh, white supremacist erasure of our authorship of our comp, comp, you know, our compositions, taking away our authorship, taking away our brilliance from it, right? Like the rice plantations, they just appeared here, right? We didn't, 
we didn't know how to build that over in Africa, right? We came over here as savages, right? No, no, no. We're engineers. We're fucking brilliant. And we built, we, we built these, these vast fields, rice fields, and, and created and subsequently created all this white wealth. Um, anyway, so sorry, that was just me adding my, my trademark commentary <laughs> about how Charleston does this fuckery every day. Burleigh's name does not appear unless Antonin Dvorak's does, which is, that's a crime, y'all. Not even in the most black... Okay. There's a, there's a truck outside my window with tinted windows. I don't know. That keeps parking here. Hold on a second, y'all. Exhaust is really loud. Okay. I'm just, Okay. Sorry about that. That scared me. That, that car's exhaust was very loud. Um, so it's a crime that his name is. is so anyway, so not even in the most black oriented, black authored, and black produced publications. They don't even. They they, they always pair Dvorak with, um, with Burley, right? Um, when his name is mentioned without Dvorak, the context in which it appears carries the implication that Burley must have been a great singer since he was featured was a featured soloist at a white church, St. George Episcopal church in New York uh, for 50 years. Right. Uh, not even in my edit, not even in my edited black music in Harlem Renaissance um, was Burley given more than a modicum of space scattered throughout the volume. Um, and let me, I'm gonna stop it there for a second because this is what actually encouraged me to kind of do a live stream on this because what I wanted to do is like, let this be the first of, of a number of like, unsung heroes in Charleston who've contributed to arts and culture. And I really want to, and I think Porgy and Bess is going to be that next live stream where we examine DeBose Hayward and his proximity to black culture and how I believe that he just, he just watched and, 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 and I don't know. I, I really don't like Porgy and Bess like that. I'm sorry. I like the reimagining, you know, led by black artists and dancers and all that. I like that. But I, I just struggle with it. Like, that's not the, oh, I don't want to, I want to see, yeah, it, it's complicated. I don't know. Carmen kind of is complicated too, but I fuck with Carmen more than I fuck with Porgy and Bess. I just, I think it's because of like, what's the story that wasn't told and, and the, the lack of dignity afforded to the, um, the Porgy character in its, in its, um, early depictions. Um, even though we do know Porgy was, handicapped it was disabled um i struggle i struggle with the lack of dignity afforded to some of the black characters as penned by white white authors and white composers gershwin or hayward that's me but um and i, I know that upsets a lot of black people who have participated in porgy and bass but it shouldn't i mean that 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 piece has always been controversial um on some level on some level um but a lot of people really start um caping for it Joni, you said something in the chat. We don't support any type of creativity in the country, uh, in this country, right? Including, yeah, we don't. We don't. Yeah. I, yeah I, and same for Sarah, you said you would like to see stuff like this. Yes, in Charleston. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I really, like, Little Mama, you, shout out to you. I talked about this yesterday. Um, Little Mama stopped by to drop off ravioli and a bunch of other dope things. I talked about this yesterday. Um, but we talked about it real quick about, like, how I want to see more public art here in Charleston. We got to see more, like, like other than just boats and, and seascapes and shit. Like, I want to I wanna, I wanna see more than just, like, you know, oh, look what I did with this rope, <laughs> this boat rope or whatever the fuck. I, I want to see more. And, and like, and, and, and L. Cool J talked about this the other day when I, when I, um, we talked about Eartha Kitt and then I, and, and L. Cool J, shout out Lynn, Lynn brought up the Oxford American South Carolina issue that came out in 20, 2019. And, um, and we started talking about that, um, Eartha Kitt's contributions, but, but then, um, what, what came up, well, what, wait, hold on, let me land my own plane. We talked about that, the contributions there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then um, L. Cool J talked about, there was, so there was, a, there was a music compilation included, and it was all this different, all these different artists from, from Charleston, the obscure and the, the, the well-known, like, Ranky Tanky, to, like, this obscure uh, female MC who they cannot identify. They could not identify who she is, but they found this track, this early hip-hop track. And what, what the compilation opened my eyes to was, damn, Charleston gave birth to, like, such a vast, like, like, a vast bunch of artists 
and we don't lift up anything if it's not ranky tanky, if it's not jazz, if it's not orchestral or symphonic. We don't really, if it's not spiritual, spiritual, gospels and shit. Like we don't lift up all these other contributions where black people aren't just singing something soulful and and, and spiritual. Nah, like they created radical work that challenged systems that that broke molds. And I'd love to see more of that in Charleston, period. Like more public art. Look, I know Charleston's never going to be hospitable to graffiti and shit, right? The, the essence of hip hop. I know that. But it would be kind of fucking dope if they commissioned a statue like how Philadelphia does, right? Philadelphia's done amazing things. Y'all know I've lived there for 10 years. Philadelphia does amazing things with public art. Of course, New York does as well. Miami does things with public art that uh, that we could do. Um, I mean, name the city, y'all. It's got, got banging public art. Name the city. And why don't we have that here? Why is it always no shade but shade? Why is it always Jonathan Green? Or some white artists I can't identify because it all looks the same. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I'm, and no shade, no shade, but shade. Like Jonathan, pass the fucking rock sometime, dude. Like pass the ball. You don't know, Jonathan Green, you don't know no black women artists that you could like give an alley oop to? Shit. <laughs> I'm all mad at somebody who didn't do nothing wrong. I mean, men, men can always do more. People who identify as men can always do more. So I stopped right there. I mean, I want mean, to continue this because what this author is saying is like, hey, even I haven't given this man, Harry T. Burley, his flowers. I even only gave him a, a little bit of space in my own publications about the black renaissance, the black Harlem renaissance. That's what this is what this author is saying. Right. Right. And they're saying how we always talk about Harry T. Burley. His, his excellence is so great. But yet we only talk about him in his uh, when it's his, when he's proximate to white people historically or to uh, a European person, which is white. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. All right. So um, the context of uh, da, 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 implication. Right. Great singer soloist for 50 years at a white church. Got it. Not even. Yeah. yeah da, 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 da. Was even. Da, 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 da. Scattered through the bottom. Okay. In order to place my observations in context, I would divert for a moment. Okay. So he talks about some roots here. But anyway, I, I like how they talk about his invisibility um, in this piece. And in, in the first couple of pages that I read, um, they talk about his invisibility. And like, how do we prevent that from happening in places like Charleston that loves to whitewash? They have a tendency to whitewash everything. How do we um, find these these con contributors and how do we daylight them and how do we share them with the with the vast pub with the vast with the with the public? And I think that's a challenge. And I'm I'm going to continue to talk about this. I'm really interested in getting to the poor game best thing because it strikes a nerve. But I want to address that. Um, we'll do that. We'll talk about um, uh, Charleston, kind of like the SPS. Yeah, we just read about the SPS in 1922 and its origins. But we're going to talk about that practice um, that the SPS. Uh, trafficked in, which is taking white, taking black culture and passing it off as their own, all right, and not letting black people participate, not letting black people own and benefit financially from their own art, right? And we're going to talk about that, that fight over historical memory, that fight over shit, um, artistic memory. I'm going to make up a phrase that I don't even know if it exists, but I'm going to call it artistic memory. Um, but yeah, things that are classically black and have African roots and how we've been erased from it, like country music, right? Um, name the genre, <laughs> the classical music. We just realized that classical music. Well, not just realized, but we talked about it, right? We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about Porgy and Bess. We're going to unpack it, but I want to say thank you. I just wanted to kind of calm down a little bit. Asheville, Portland, Seattle. Was, yep. 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 Denver. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to end it there. I invite you tomorrow. Going to be a doozy. I calmed it down just so I can heat it up tomorrow. So I don't know if you're busy with the kids and making like uh, a family style breakfast for the whole, uh, for the entire family that's in town. I don't know where you at right now. I don't know. But all I do, all I know is that I'm going to show up Thursday will be the last live stream of the week. Come back on Monday in the new year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Thursday, we're going to just, that's going to be the last live stream on Thursday. Headspace tomorrow, draw the winner of the tattoo giveaway contest. Stay tuned. Tomorrow we're going to make it extra fucking spicy. I'm going to dig deep into the book club selection of the month. The Trouble with White Women. We're going to dig into that and also dig into some other type of class analysis that we're going to do about Charleston's boutique owning glitterati. 
Ooh, so this is beyond, this is a little bit deeper than just Southern Charm. We're going to talk about Southern Charm. I'm going to get some people in excited about it. Oh, we're going to talk about Southern Charm tomorrow and a controversy, but not the way that I've typically talked about it, right? Not just from my vantage point of being called a monkey by one of its, um, uh, its lead figures. We're going to talk about the phenomena of white people, white women acting shamefully and then like being rewarded with it in society um, and, and this um, and this lofty lifestyle that they perpetuate that they can't even afford or that they're not they're not being honest about um, how they make their money. Right. So we're going to talk about it tomorrow. We're going to elevate the conversation, elevate the level of discourse around uh, influencer culture, white women who traffic in that and that 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 boutique owning glitterati here in Charleston, South Carolina. All right. Going to make some white women angry tomorrow and their husbands, too. Join me. Bye. Love you for the hype trains. Bye. Love y'all. <laughs>